Okay, so welcome everyone to another episode of Policy Emma Combs. Uh, I'm sorry we're a little late here. It was my fault on the Zoom link having a bit of a problem. Uh, it's a pleasure to have with us again today, uh, Emily Oster, Professor of Economics at Brown University. And Emily, I think, is the moto guest in our institute. Uh, it's her third appearance here, which is not surprising given that she spent her life writing about data-driven decision-making and trade-off thinking. So, Emily, thank you so much. And she joins us again to talk about her new book, The Family Firm, A Data-Driven Guide. Let me read carefully here. To better decisions making in an early school years. Emily, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Carlos. It's very nice to see you. I'm excited to be back here as the modal at the as the modal guest. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to talk uh, about the book, um, and then I think we will also hopefully have a little time at some point for for questions. Okay. Um, so. Uh, so I am a professor of economics at Brown University, and I'm also increasingly a writer. Uh, and I, I wrote sort of two, two books a number of years ago on pregnancy and parenting. Uh, one of them is called Expecting Better. That's about pregnancy. And there's a book called Crib Sheet, which is about uh, early, early parenting in the first three or, three or four years. And those books are really very grounded in data. And they take the approach that you know we can make better decisions in our parenting and pregnancy if we are uh, really engaged with the uh, with the data. So an example question is in there is something like swaddling. So should I swaddle my baby? Uh, will it make them sleep better? And what's really nice about that question is that it has an answer, and it has an answer that can be found in data and evidence. And so, for example, researchers can take babies and they can bring them into a sleep lab and they can wrap them up in some kind of swaddle that's also covered in all kinds of sensors and they can videotape them and they can watch the same baby with a swaddle, without a swaddle. And they can tell you with some pretty high degree of confidence that like, yes, babies do sleep better when they're swaddled. And the reason is that when they sort of start to wake up, which happens very commonly with babies, if they are swaddled, they are less likely to move from the sort of initial stirring into a more wakeful state. So that's an example of a question that's like really grounded in data and well answered with data. And there's a lot in the um, in the first in my first books that are that are that is in that space uh, where data matters. And a lot of the work of the first books is to really dig into, you know, which data should we believe and which data should we not believe. Just because something is amenable to an answer with data doesn't mean that every study about it is going to be as good. So I, I now have, so when I sort of thought about older kids, uh, which I now have, so I have a six-year-old and, and an, well, no, I have a seven-year-old and an 11-year-old. You gotta be careful about your children's birthdays. Um, so when I got to sort of thinking about writing about older older kid parenting, uh, I, I kind of realized that that the approach that I had been taking both to my own parenting but also to the to the way I was I was writing about parenting, uh, something new was was needed. And so you know in particular that the data is is sort of no longer enough in this phase, and that in fact what I needed was a better way to approach decision making and to approach family structure. And in doing that, both in my own life and then later in writing this book, I really drew a lot of lessons from businesses, from firms, and sort of thinking about uh, with my kind of former business school professor hat on, uh, thinking about how firms operate or how they should operate and how some of those tools or some of those lessons are, are relevant for our households. Now, I will say that when you say to people, operate your family like a firm, they basically think you're a jerk. Uh, and so, so, so some of the, the barrier here is the feeling that the idea of, you know, be a firm with your family is kind of cold or, or impersonal. And, and a, a version of this I hear, uh, I hear a lot is the idea is sort of the phrase like, well, you know, like we, like we love each other, you know, in my family, in my family, we love each other and loving each other is, you know, is enough. And that's how we operate well as a family. And I think in some ways, the kind of key message of this book is that you can love your partner and you can still want them to update their Asana tasks and press complete on them when they are, when they are done. 
And I'm going to try to convince you of this. I'm going to try to convince you that you can make the business of running a family, the logistics part of running a household with multiple jobs, maybe, or multiple kids, or even no kids and only one job, that there are a lot of logistics in our lives that we would do better if we could almost take a little bit of the emotion out of them, or at least approach them in a more systematic way. And so I want to, when I talk about the book today, I want to sort of talk about basically three, three insights that I think we take or at least I take out of out of firm operation into my uh, into into our households. And I think these are kind of well motivated with with three stories. So the first uh, first thing I want you to imagine um, is that you are a person with children, uh, and that you have you are typically in charge of bedtime, and you have an idea about what time bedtime is. You think bedtime is eight o'clock, and every night that you're around eight o'clock is the time that your kids go to bed and they go to bed and then you, you know, watch Bridgerton or whatever activities the rest of us are, are doing. So then one day, unexpectedly, post-pandemic, you are, you are away for a business trip and you call your partner and it's 10 o'clock at night. And so you call them to, to check in and you can hear in the background that your kid is awake, that your kid is awake and you can hear them. I don't know what, what are they, they're watching TV. So you say to your partner, what, what's happening here? Like, what are you doing? Why is, you know, why is Felix still awake? It's 10 o'clock at night. Partner says, well, I don't know. I didn't, you know, he didn't want to go to bed. He said, but eight o'clock is bedtime. And your partner says, well, that's your rule. My rule is an eight o'clock at bedtime is bedtime. And of course, now you're tired and you're away and you're angry. And so maybe you yell, or maybe they, they, they yell. Um, and, you know, you end with something like, well, that's your rule. And if you don't, if you want me to follow that rule, you shouldn't leave town. A second example of the story. Your partner, or maybe you, you're typically, again, in this scenario, you are in charge uh, of getting your kids out the door in the morning for camp. And one day you ask your partner to do it because you're busy with something else maybe Bridgerton related. And, uh, and you, you finish whatever the other thing is you're doing. You come downstairs and you find your partner getting your kid ready to camp for a camp. And the first thing that you start doing is telling them that they're doing it wrong. Those are the wrong shoes. That's the wrong kind of snack. Wrong, uh, though, that's the wrong sunscreen. Don't put that sunscreen on. We use the other sunscreen. That sunscreen goes on the face. Why don't they have a hat? What is, that isn't the right tennis racket. And on and on and on until, of course, your partner says, you know, if you want to do this, you do it yourself. The third story, which is not so much about conflict, but really about, about decision-making, uh, is the question of whether Sylvia, your 11-year-old, should join the travel soccer team. Decisions like this come up frequently, or maybe not frequently, but at least some of the time. Our kids show up at home, they say, hey, I'm dying to do this activity. I've got to join the travel soccer team. All my friends are going to be on it. We're all going to do it together. It's going to be amazing. Like, please, please, please. Ah, you got to let me do it or everyone's going to hate me. And they're going to be friends. They're going to be friends with me. And so it's, it's with on and on and on. And, and in the moment, the way that you make this decision is almost just reactive. The way that you would make a decision with a little kid, like, yeah, 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 sure. I just, I have to finish dinner. Sure. Travel soccer. Yes, fine. Travel soccer. We'll do whatever he's doing. It. Let's just do travel soccer. But then you wake up, you know, three months later, having signed up for this travel soccer to find that travel soccer is four night practices a week. And every other weekend you have to be in, you know, another state uh, going on the travel soccer, soccer travel activity. There's something wrong with doing travel soccer. But if you didn't think about the commitment that was going to be that was going to be required here, you may find yourself in a situation that you really don't like that in fact is not fulfilling the kind of household or the kind of lifestyle or the kind of schedule that you and your family want, want to have. So I see these as sort of three problems, uh, two of which are really about conflict and one of which is more about logistics and sort of thinking through the relationships between all the things that we do in our, in our, busy, uh, in our busy lives. And so I'm gonna argue in the book for kind of, there are three problems, maybe there's, there's three solutions. One is I call the big picture. One I call triage and policies. And the one that I call the four Fs. So I wanna go through the sort of basic ideas behind these, uh, behind these, these solutions uh, uh, today. And then hopefully that will whet your appetite a little bit for, for kind of thinking about some of these, how some of these tools could be useful in your own lives. 
So, oh, and so I should say, uh, I mentioned at the beginning that I, my sort of first love and still my my main love uh, is is data. And I think that you know the truth is that. Uh, that when we think about all of these solutions here, all of the ways that we're going to interact with the with the world and that we're going to make our decision making better, there is data that plays into all of these. Uh, and when I wrote this book, I sort of wrote a lot of the content that I'm going to talk about today sort of up at the top and then said, hey, to like operationalize this as effectively as possible, you really need some data because that's going to tell you what are the decisions you want to make? What are the things that you want to, to prioritize? Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about data uh, data later, but I think it's almost the overlay of all of these uh, all of these other tools. All right. So uh, so first, I want to talk about this idea of of what I call the the big picture. The idea here is that uh, that you will make better decisions as a family. Um, and here I say family, and I'm sort of often going to talk about this as if there is you know two partners and and some, some children. I actually think a lot of these things are relevant if it's a, one parent and some children or one parent and a child or partners with, with no kids, that there's some sort of flexibility in these, uh, in these tools. But whatever is your family, is your family structure. I wanna sort of start by thinking about people writing down or, or kind of articulating in some way, but I think writing down is really, is really valuable, their primary values and priorities. And here, there are a lot of different ways that people engage with this question of what is your value and, and priority. So for some people, uh, the easiest way to do this is to try to have like a single nice like mission statement. So to say something like my goal in this, uh, my goal in this um, is to, uh, like my goal in my family is to I don't know, prioritize religion or raise, uh, you know, healthy kids or like something that that is a sort of captures the mission of your of your family. And for some people, that's really clarifying to be able to sort of write down exactly what you are you think you are trying to accomplish in a in a short in a short statement. Another way you could think about going through this, and you may want to do multiple of these, you may have, find one is more compelling than than another, is to think about you know three main goals for your children for your family. Uh, broadly, sort of what are the three things that are most important that would be most indicative of success in whatever you're trying to, to achieve. There's an even more basic version of this, which is almost for me the, the sort of most valuable, which is to literally write down, like, what are the three things you want to do every day, right? And that's a, in some ways very practical. It's much less like highfalutin than the idea of, of a mission statement. But of course, your, your life is made up of Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays. And so if every Tuesday you think, ah, I'm not doing any of the things I wanna do on Tuesday, then you're not gonna be happy. Uh, and even just saying, what are the things I really wanna get in is a way to kind of clarify what are your values? What are your priorities? If every Tuesday you wanna be having dinner with your family and you're not, then you are not living up to the priorities that, uh, that, that, you, that you may hope for. Um, so for me, I will say, uh, when sort of we sit down as a family to think about this, there's no, we have very little, we've never managed to, to get a mission statement. So because I talk about this in the book, people will say, well, what's your family mission statement? And I sort of like hem and haw about, well, it's something about trying to, to raise adults. But like, the truth is that when I asked my family, what should our mission statement be? The best thing we came up with was no papaya, because it's like the one food thing we all agree on, just nobody likes papaya. Um, that's not a very helpful mission statement it is an easy one to achieve um, because you never are forced to eat papaya, but it's it's not super helpful. But some of these other things, you know, particularly thinking about what we want our schedule to look like, what we want to prioritize have been very, um, have been very, very clarifying. Uh, two other sort of points to make if you kind of want to embark on trying to generate some kind of big picture here. First, there's a huge amount of value, and this actually comes out of research and data from a bunch of different areas um, in, in psychology. There's a huge amount of value in, uh, in writing these kinds of things down first, uh, separately, and then sort of showing, showing each other what, uh, what they are. So rather than, uh, rather than coming at this and saying, well, let me say first what I think, and then you say back what you think, in which case your, you know, your desire you're 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 gonna um, mirror what I'm saying because that's how 
people work to be able to actually sort of articulate these separately and then and then bring them together has a lot of um, has a lot of value. The other thing is that I, I emphasize here a lot around the idea of there should be three things, there should be four things, there should be a small number of things. And the, the reason for that is that you cannot die on every hill. And it cannot be the case that every single thing is the most important thing for you. And by restricting our scope, the scope of our choices here, we force something about our, our own priorities. And that's useful um, in almost any of these, in almost any of these settings. All right, so this is the first step is this idea of, uh, of sort of values and priorities. The second solution I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about here, the second kind of approach that I think is helpful um, is the idea of, of what I call a triage or, or policies. So in particular, you know, you've like articulated what the big picture is, the things that are most important to you. When you like dial down to your day to day, there are actually a lot of, a lot of things in your life uh, decisions that you make all the time, decisions that are very, very frequent. So here are a bunch of examples, you know, how should mealtime work? What's an acceptable snack if you have kids who are, you know, you're, you're feeding? When there are plates in the sink, like what happens to them? How long can they stay there for? Uh, how much TV is okay? How much screen time in general is okay? How often do your kids need to bathe? And these are actually all things where uh, I, I sort of, there's a data piece of it. So, so where questions like, you know, what's, what's a good meal policy? How important is it to have family meals? Or how should we think about the value of different kinds of nutrition? Those are all uh, questions where there is often, there is some data on them. Uh, and in the book, I actually talked through a bunch of different pieces of data around questions like nutrition and, and family meals, but also around screen time. I don't actually talk about that. Those are not that important. Um, and so there's a bunch of these decisions you make all the time. Um, and uh, which are which are informed by data, but with sort of which you don't need to think about every single time. So it's not the case that every single time you sit down for a, for a meal or you sit down for a day of meals that you want to be revisiting the data on that. You probably want to revisit the data on that occasionally, or you want to have made some decisions at the uh, at at the beginning. These are not things about which you will always uh, you will always agree. Uh, so people have different views on questions like what's an acceptable snack or do your kids always need to, to bathe? And sometimes that disagreement is fine. Sometimes that disagreement is, is okay. And we can parent or, or, you know, approach our children in different, in different ways. And sometimes it's, it's kind of not. So, uh, so in my household or in my sort of personal value system, having meals with my kids, uh, is, is really important. That's a, that's a sort of very key component of, of the, the priorities that I see for our family. Uh, whereas how frequently they take a bath while I have opinions about it, because I have opinions about everything. And if I were the dictator, we would do it a particular way. It's actually not something that's very, uh, that's very important to me, but what's, what's sort of, I think central to note about these decisions is that if you haven't said what's important to you or if you haven't talked about which of these things are your family meal time versus your bath time it is impossible for people to know what is the uh what is the the relevant um what is the the most in it is impossible for us to get on the same page and so this second piece, this sort of second solution here is really about sort of starting by saying, okay, up front, uh, we are gonna talk about which of these things, uh, we are gonna talk about these things. We're gonna talk about the question in the abstract of like, what is an appropriate snack? Or what is our mealtime policy? Or what are we gonna say about baths? And we're gonna come out with, you know, this is important. This is something we wanna prioritize. And this is something where maybe we don't care as much about it or it's not as, uh, as important. Where is there flexibility? Where can we just decide, you know, everyone just sort of does their own thing. And where are we gonna be rigid? And we're gonna say, you know, here is like, this is something that we are gonna agree is a priority that we're gonna get done uh, no matter sort of, no matter what. Um, and again, the sort of reminder here is that you, you can't die on every hill. Not everything can be the thing you are most rigid about. Uh, and, and by talking about these together, and particularly by maybe talking about some of them all at the same time, you may get to a point where you can understand, okay, here's something on which 
you know, we have to have a little bit of, of flexibility, or maybe this thing really isn't as important as I kind of thought it was in my, uh, in my, in my mind. There's an implementation piece of this solution, which is, okay, we've sat down and talked about these. Now we're going to write them down. We're going to write them down, partly because that's a way for us to make sure that we are on the same page. And partly because then we can do what I call here total responsibility transfer, which is that once something is written down, once we have sort of a, agreed on this, in principle, we should all be able to implement it. And that's, uh, and that's a, a really, I think, a key piece that is missing in a lot of our households is the idea that any person can do multiple of the tasks. And figuring out, and, and we talk a lot about um, talk a lot about sort of the, the second shift and, and women sort of taking on too much of the responsibility in households and taking on too much of the, of the emotional work and the, and the mental load. I think a big piece of that is that, that sometimes one parent and is more frequently the, the woman is holding all of this information about like how we do things. It lives only here, it lives only up in your head. It doesn't live out in the world. And so it would be impossible to transfer that in the moment because like it's all here and you'd have to unload it all into like a, into like some bucket to, to give it to someone who just like can't do that. And so what I'm saying here is unload that into a Google doc uh, when you have a quiet moment and then it becomes at least somewhat easier to, to transfer some of that responsibility. So I think sort of stepping back a little bit, a lot of this early stuff is really about sort of talking through things with, um, with, with a partner and sort of trying to get on the same page with, uh, with them. It's about setting expectations, about agreeing on sort of what's, what's important. And I, I will note um, that sometimes, maybe frequently, this kind of approach is going to surface conflicts. When I talk about this with people, sometimes they'll tell me, well, this, you know, this sounds like a great approach if you always agree with your spouse. And if you always agree with your spouse, then you'll all write down the same family mission and the same priorities and the same snack rules. And you'll compare notes and you'll say, oh, it's so great that we found someone who's exactly like us on all of these dimensions. And, you know, but that wouldn't work for me because my spouse and I don't agree on those things. Uh, and so if we wrote them down, we would only find that we didn't, that we didn't agree. And I think what I'd say to that is that, that that first couple, the people who agree on all the snacks and all the other things, they don't really, they don't really need to do any of this because I guess they already agree, although I can still see some, some value. I think in, in fact, it is precisely because you are going to surface conflicts that you should, that you should do this because surfacing those conflicts on purpose in a moment in which you expect there to be conflict, but also in a moment in which it's conflict in the abstract. It's not, I can't believe you gave them Reese's Pieces for snack when I told you it was only fruit. It's not in that moment. It's in the moment where you step back and you say, hey, let's talk about like, is Reese's Pieces a good snack or is fruit a good snack? Or is sometimes one of those things a good snack? What, like, how are we going to approach this? And that's a much less emotionally fraught moment to have that conflict, even though, yes, doing this is going to surface some, uh, some conflicts, but they're conflicts you would have anyway. Those are also like, some of those decisions are sort of small, but we also make a lot of, of big decisions. Um, what school should our kids go to? What kinds of extracurriculars should they should they do? You know, should I take a new job? How should I think about COVID? Uh, and these big decisions they don't come along all the time, um, but uh, but they come along you know some of the times. And when when they do, uh, we we need to to make them. Um, so I want to talk now about sort of the, an approach to making some of these kind of larger decisions, these less frequent big picture decisions, decisions that are gonna impact a lot of our, of our lives or a lot of the moments of our lives, like the travel soccer example, where whether you recognize it in the moment or not, it actually will impact a lot of what your life looks like, at least over some, over some period. So I wanna talk about one decision, uh, which is sleep. So I wanna sort of focus in on, on the question of bedtime. Uh, but before I do that, let me sort of give you a little bit of what I, uh, what I, how I've sort of organized this this process. Um, it has because it's like a business school. Everything's got to have like, you know, little acronyms. So this is a this is a four a four four Fs. So everything starts with an F. Uh, so first, the first step here is to frame frame the question. Uh, the second one is fact find. Uh, third thing is a final decision, and the fourth step is follow up. So. 
I always think it's best to, to talk through these kinds of things in, a, uh, in an example. And so I'm gonna talk about it in this sleep example. All right, so let's start by the question of, of let's start with the, with the idea of, uh, of framing the question here. So one way you could ask the question about the right bedtime for your kids, which is the sort of broad topic area of this, of this question is, we could ask, should bedtime be at 7 p.m. or not? That framing is unhelpful uh, because it is too vague. And it is reminiscent of the way we frame many of the questions that we ask. So we are often asking questions of ourselves, of our, of our parenting uh, that are in the space of, should I do blah or not? Should I send my kid to this school or not? Should I send my kid to daycare in the wake of COVID or not? Should I you know, in, enroll them in, in the violin or not? And, and the thing about that, the thing that makes that, those questions hard to answer is that, uh, that or not uh, is not well-defined. So in, I, I started talking about this a lot last year when we were talking about COVID and this kind of early period of not last year, this is whatever, 25 years ago, no, two years ago, uh, when we were sort of first experiencing the kind of first way out of, of COVID, a lot of people were asking the question, you know, well, my childcare is reopened. Should I send my kid back to childcare or not? And I would say, you know, well, or not, it's not a childcare solution. It's like, or, or not, it's not going to be there while you're, while you're at work. You need to actually say what is in that other category. And the reason that that's so important is that if you haven't said that, you have basically no ability to make this decision because now you are weighing one concrete option against the sort of infinite set of other, of other things. And that infinite set has really no benefits or costs. It's just a sort of infinite set of imaginary-ness. And so in some sense, it always seems great. It always seems terrible. It's just it's impossible to think at all about, about or not. So or not's not a bedtime. So you can't say 7 p.m. or not. You can ask the question, uh, the question should, should bedtime be at 7 p.m. or 8 p.m.? Should bedtime be at a fixed time every, every day? These are all more concrete questions. And in the case of bedtime, I think it's easy to see that, okay, yes, I do need to weigh sort of two, two, particular, two particular things. But I think if you sort of reflect on how we make a lot of these decisions, we are often not fully framing one or two, not, sorry, two, like say two or three, concrete examples, concrete options, and then weighing and then weighing those things. So the first question is to ask the first idea is to ask the question in the right way to frame the question in a way that might have an answer. So this second step here, sorry, my slides are, so the second step here is, uh, is to, to fact find. So fact finding uh, in the, in the earlier work that I do is really all about data. It was all that kind of, okay, I'm going to get the data on swaddling or breastfeeding or whatever. And that's going to kind of be all the facts that I, that I need. It may not make the decision for me, but at least it's the, it's kind of the, the fact piece of this. Here, I'm going to, I'm going to argue that in a lot of these decisions, there's both the, the kind of fact data piece, but then also a logistics piece, a piece of this decision-making, which, which is going to uh, going to require you to think about the way that these decisions will intersect with other decisions and other things that you care about, other things that you need to do, just other generic logistics of your life, be they financial or time constraints or any of the other constraints that you, uh, that you have. In the case of sleep, I want to sort of start with the question of, is sleep important? Um, partly because I, I actually think this is a place where the data is just really interesting. Um, so does sleep matter? So the easiest way to see that sleep matters is with adults and college students. So with adults and college students, you can actually do uh, sort of sleep lab studies where you keep people up all night uh, and you then see how that how they react to them. Um, and when you when you keep people up, when you keep college students, for example, up for the whole night, uh, they and then you give them tests. The thing that's very interesting is that what you find is they do worse on the tests. It's not too surprising because people need sleep, um, but, uh, but they think that they did better. So the sleep has caused both poor cognitive performance and a like weird college student overconfidence where they think that they're great, but actually they are not, not even as good as they were, as they were before. 
So that's college students. And that's also like a very extreme treatment of literally staying up all, all night. And we look at kids, we, it's unethical to keep six-year-olds up all night. It would also be almost certainly close to you know, be very difficult, but anyway, we don't do studies like that. Um, and also that's actually not that interesting question because when you're asking about bedtime, you're not asking the question like, what would happen if I've never had my kids sleep? Uh, what you're asking is, you know, how much does it matter if like every night I keep them up an extra hour or what, how valuable would it be for them to go to sleep an hour earlier? And so to evaluate this, we have some RCT evidence, some randomized control trial evidence. Um, and what they do in these studies, they, they randomize kids, actually it's a sequential rent. So they actually do every treatment with every, every kid, kind of interesting. Um, so what they, what they do is they have people keep their kid up uh, either sort of go to bed at their normal time, keep them up an extra hour, or keep them or give them, make them sleep an hour, an hour earlier. So it's really a small variation. It's only about four days of a week. And then at the end of the week, they bring them into the, to the lab and they see how they perform on cognitive tests. And they ask their parents about their behavior. And even that one less hour for sort of four days of the week affects kids' performance on cognitive tests. And it affects whether their parents say that they are uh, sort of how, the, how their parents say they are, they are behaving. And so that's a, that's a small variation, but it, it, it really does seem to, seem to matter. We have other evidence uh, from even sort of slightly older kids typically uh, around sort of what happens when you make school start times later. So teenagers in particular, they like to sleep in the morning, I, it would seem. Um, and so, so they, it's, it's hard, they like to stay up at late, at late at night and sleep later in the day. And so these early start times of school really cut into kids, kids sleep. So there's some sort of push to have these like later school start times. And part of how we can see whether those are effective is that there are school districts where there's like variation in when school starts, just because, I don't know, mostly because of bus schedules. Uh, and, uh, and what we see is that when kids are, uh, have later school start times, they sleep more, their school performance is better. Actually, in some of these studies, we even see uh, fewer car accidents as a result of this. So it seems like sleep is really mattering for that, for that population. There's also a very nice study out of a boarding school where they, for, a, for some period, basically as an experiment, they moved all the class times to a half an hour later. So rather than starting at eight, they started at 8.30 or something. Uh, and it was actually very costly for the school because something about the sports schedule meant that they like couldn't, they, that was just like literally time that was taken away from class. It couldn't be made up in any other way. But what they found was the kids were like, enormously happier um, and they were much less likely to like miss class to go to the nurse and sleep, which is something you can do at boarding school. Uh, and so it was just like thing where they thought it was gonna be short term because it was so costly in terms of class time, but they ended up extending it indefinitely because it was so positive and because the kids actually got more additional sleep than was uh, implied by the lengthened time. And when they did these interviews, they asked the kids, well, like, what, like you're getting an extra 45 minutes of sleep and they only moved at, at a half an hour. The kids said, well, I noticed, like they have these quotes where kids are like, well, I noticed how much better I felt when I slept more. So I decided to go to bed earlier because clearly sleep is, is important. Now, uh, if, you, if you sort of buy into this, and I would say I really buy into this, into the idea that sleep is really crucial uh, for, for children and for adults, um, there's a question of like, how much is enough? Because actually the numbers that you're quoted are very, are quite variable. So sort of nine to 11 hours, actually a really big range. It could be as little as seven, could be as much as 12. That's like almost the entire possible real line of this. Um, the reality is it depends a lot on your kid, but uh, it is not that hard to figure out because if your kid is well-rested, they should not be sleepy. They should not be falling asleep at school. They should not be yawning all the time at school. And if you let them sleep in on the weekend, they should not do it or they should not do it very much. So a, a sort of person who is not sleep deprived, if given a, like they should be waking up at basically the same time. Um, and if you know your kid is sleeping in three extra hours on the weekend, that suggests they're not getting enough sleep during the week. So that's the kind of like the part of this, it's about the, the data on sleep. There's a different part of this fact finding step, which is about the logistics which is about recognizing that time for sleep has to come from something else. 
And that when you think about what is the right bedtime, it's actually not only a decision about what is the time your kid goes to bed, it's also a decision about when are you gonna eat meals and what kind of extracurriculars can they do? You know, if gymnastics is from five to 8.30 at night, three times a week, your kid actually can't go to sleep at 8.30 because they're at gymnastics. And so those are two, those are not two decisions. That's one decision. The decision about whether, what time is bedtime and the decision about whether to do competitive gymnastics, those are the same decision, or at least they overlap to an extent that I think we don't always recognize. So again, there's like logistics and then there's facts and we got to bring them all together. And once we do, uh, we are then in a position to make a final decision. And the main point in the book around these sort of final decision making question is to, to suggest to people that when we make those decisions, we make these kind of these, these choices, uh, that we should do so with all the information, that the right approach to this kind of decision making is not to get one piece of data and make a decision and then get another piece of data and change our mind and then get a third piece of data and talk to this person and make a different decision, that in fact, what we need to do is get all the information, try very hard while we're fact finding not to be decision making. There's fact finding, decision making's over here. Once you have the facts, kind of bring them together and you sit down with them and you sit down with whoever is relevant for this decision. You say, okay, we're gonna make a decision. here. We're gonna make a decision and we're gonna write it down and then we're not gonna make it again, at least not in the moment. We're gonna make the decision, we're gonna move on. Except there's fourth F, which is follow-up says that almost all the decisions we make, there is an opportunity to revisit them. Uh, and there is an opportunity to think about them again. We rarely take those opportunities in part because we don't want to be wrong. So if I have made a choice to do some activity or to send my kid to a particular school or some other choice, I don't want to then revisit at the end of the year and be like, boy, that was a poor choice because I, I don't want to have been to have been wrong, but that desire, that desire to to sort of not be wrong, to keep going with our with our decisions, so we can prove that we that we were right, that is uh, that is very costly, uh, because if I was wrong, then I have perhaps extended the wrongness uh, indefinitely. And so, what I suggest that people do in these in a lot of these decisions is they plan a time to follow up and decide whether the decision was correct a kind of follow-up period. Uh, because if you do that, at least cognitively, there's a little bit of a shift to say, okay, well, it's not necessarily that I was wrong. I always plan to revisit this. I always plan part of the, the sort of decision was the plan to, to think about it again. If I have that plan in my mind, it may be quite a bit more likely to you know, not do this activity again if it wasn't successful uh, or even to make bigger changes if things aren't, if things aren't working. So, um, so with that, uh, with that, I am, uh, I am gonna, gonna conclude. So, uh, so, you know, to come back a little bit to the, to the beginning here, I, I really built my sort of whole kind of writing career on the idea that data is uh, important. I really, really believe uh, that data is, is important, but the kind of reality when I face this, this slightly later childhood age is that the, the sort of fact finding the data piece of this actually almost the easiest. I mean, the data isn't always amazing, but sometimes it's there uh, and, and we can see it and we can, we can sort of incorporate it, but it's never, it's never enough. Uh, and it is always the rest of these pieces that are hardest, that sort of saying what your question is, actually making a decision, thinking about the interaction between logistics and, uh, and these choices and recognizing that sometimes we can't do everything that we want. Sometimes the kind of core some core value in our lives is in conflict with something that we want to do. And we're gonna to have to decide which core value is, is, more, uh, is more central. And I think this, those kind of things, the idea of, this, of, uh, of kind of constrained decision-making, that's really inside, uh, inside these sort of business lessons. Um, and so uh, my main message is that your spouse is not your business partner, but I think that you will have a better life if you treat them like they are sometimes. And with that, I'm happy to take questions about this or about earlier books or about COVID or about whatever people want. All right. Thank you, Emily. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat already, but I'll give some people <clears throat> the chance of asking themselves the questions if they just raise their hands. I'm looking at the participant list here and I'll let you speak. I see Tom here has a question. Tom, do you want to ask the question?
and see if I can make this work. All right, Tom, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask the question. Technically challenged, Tom says. Um, uh, all right, so I'll read the question. Can, um, so great book, Emily, which I'll share with my children who are in the uh, rearing families of their own. I definitely see the importance of data and analysis for managing family challenges, but it seems like a large task for typical sets of partners, given the magnitude and complexity of decisions that families confront. It seems like the time-honored approach of using experience and adaptation to make these decisions might offer many advantages. What am I missing in your conclusion? So, so let me sort of take two, two kind of two pieces there. So first is the question of just like, like is, is experience and adaptation enough? And I think that like sometimes, but I find often when I talk to people that they, they, are, they feel frustrated with the, the kind of structure that they had, that they're not achieving the particular priorities that they want or they're overwhelmed in some way and, and sort of struggling to see like, how could we make this better? And so I, I think in some sense, the answer is like, if that's working, that's great, that's working, but I don't think it is necessarily working for everyone. I will also say, and sort of answer to this first question, which is like, I would, I would describe almost as like, this seems like a lot of work, uh, which is sometimes uh, articulated, yeah. I, what, I would, what I tell people there is try one thing. So, um, so I think the best example of this is somebody who sort of said to me, you know, it seems like a lot of work, but we did, this is what we did. All we, we introduced a discussion on Sunday night where we would plan out for the week who was going to pick up our kid at daycare every day. And we had not done that before. And so every day we were fighting about, or like having some kind of interaction about who was going to go today. And so we started just on, we did this one thing, which was just on Sunday, we just say, who's getting them every day. And that little bit of advanced planning and sort of thinking about this in a more systematic way was really helpful. And so what I tell people is, you know, think about like, what's the thing you had the most conflict about last week? What's the thing that was the most logistically complicated, frustrating, like where were the sort of, where are the pain points? And is there one thing you could change? One thing you could plan better in advance that would make that possible. And that's, that's the start. And you don't have to do all the worksheets, but you could do the worksheets. There are worksheets. <laughs> you do all right, hands here, raise your hand or, and I can let you speak. Um, while people are raising their hands, there's a question here saying that love your books. Um, I read the first two. Can you recommend other parenting books uh, that you found helpful for you, to yourself? Yeah. So, so I think there are a bunch of kind of specific parenting books. So, so Tom Thalen has a, a book I really like um, called One Two. There's a book called One Two Three Magic, which is this, which is a book about toddler discipline. But he also has a book called The Manager Mom Epidemic, where I don't love the gender nature of the, of the title, but I like everything else about it, which is a sort of more specific book about a lot of the issues that I, that I, raise, um, that I raise here. But I think the answer to this question depends a little bit on like what your, like what your problem is. So, you know, they're not, not like what's your problem, but like what is the thing you're trying to, um, trying to solve? I think there's a lot of really helpful, um, you know, par parenting books for slightly older kids. So, Lindy Moyer has a very nice new book called How to How to Raise Kids Who Aren't Assholes, I think is like a little PG, uh, which is very nice. There's some excellent books on sleep training. So I think in some ways the answer to this is, is just what exactly is the is what exactly is the problem you're trying to solve. So uh, let's see if anybody else here. I have a <clears throat> I have a question on the the this framework and the, yeah. the agency of kids. Um, in no place you said the decision-making process, the listing priorities and so on should be done just by the partners, but nine out of whatever, and especially in the early years going to be very much done by the partners. And then, you know, eventually they become humans that have agency. And, and I find myself a very challenging part of parenting is that is figuring out how much agency to give them and when to give them that agency. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. I also, also find that challenging. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, part of the answer is like, it varies. Um, and your kid will age into that. Your kid will, you know, age into this. And there is going to be a time at which you just tell them, you know, this is where you, this is where we go to camp for the summer. And then later there's going to be a time in which you like let them have some say in, in that and, and figuring out where those lines are depends on your kid, depends on your, um, you know, depends on your, uh, I don't know, depends on, on how old they are. I, I will say that when we do this with our kids, um, we, uh, we like, we go like full on like business with, with them. So like, 
I give them, you know, we'll do like an agenda, like schedule a meeting, put it in my, you know, particularly for my older kid who's now 11. Like I'll put a meeting in her Google calendar. I'll email her agenda in advance. Like I have a whole, you know, and, and like try to get her to engage in it. I mean, like, I mean, it's sort of a joke, but it's also sort of like, okay, this is like, we're going to make a sort of serious decision here. And we want your input. And the, the thing that I find hardest here, and I don't have a great solution solution for is, is, you know, figuring out how much you want to have like the meeting before the meeting and restrict the, uh, the limits, um, and restrict like what the, what people can do. Right. So, so I don't want to tell my daughter, like, here's all the choices on the planet earth. If I'm not willing to, you don't want to be like, what, like, what kind of pet do you want? Where actually the only pet you will get them is a sea monkey. You know, like that's like, there the question should be, do you want a sea monkey or nothing? Um, and, uh, and that's, I think that's, that's the, that's the challenge. Kind of like, you got to decide what, what is the range of choices that you can let them, um, that you can let them make. Uh, All right. So another question here, a little tough one, uh, thoughts on parenting when you're divorced and not have ex-spouses share parenting goals, do you overcompensate when the chi child is with you? So I don't, you know, I think this question, which I get a lot is, is a place where I'd say you've got to find like a book about <laughs> managing to divorce. I mean, which is not, not intended to be a facile response, but I think that, you know, the, the kind of, there are some divorce situations in which these kind of tools I think could be quite helpful. Um, you know, managing custody in a, in a more structured way, sort of having written down, you know, goals and, and, um, and values. But of course, if it is a complicated place where you do not agree with the, with the parenting, almost the, I think almost what you say here is the only thing you can control is what happens in your house. Uh, the only thing you can control is the stuff that you can control. And so, as with many hard decisions, it may be that um, that the right way to say it is like you can't you can't control what they do, and so all you can do is sort of take this constrained suboptimal situation and try to make the best choices for yourself, which will involve your your house. And the question of whether you should overcompensate or not should be structured as like what is the best way to run my household, not you know what can I do that it may be that you want to do things to fix what the other person is doing, but it's not clear that that's, um, that that's the right way to frame it. All right. There's a couple more here. Let me ask one of my own first. And it's a, I don't know how to ask the question uh, very carefully, but I'll try. So you name a couple things like sleeping, for example, is something that's very practical, very like you see the results of it almost right away. Right? If the yeah. kid is too tired, they're going to have a hard time, no matter what you're focusing on, whether it's school, whether it's playing, whatever, right? Their lives are going to be harder. And all of us, if we're overtired and therefore clearly playing and making decisions, and that's very important, short-term, hopefully long-term as well. But a lot of decisions we're making are long-term. And we all tend to think that those decisions matter a lot. Uh, but the data on that, as you point out, is kind of, you know, type of school you send your kid to, like, does it matter? Well, you know, it's hard, right? How much time they spend doing extracurricular activity versus not. Uh, there's all sorts of things that we don't have a good handle on it. And some people have this perspective of like, well, we have really, you know, don't worry about it too much, right? So clearly you're, you, you write books to a crowd, to an audience that probably is an audience of control, right? That wants to have more control and more uh, purposeful decision-making. Um, and on these things, when you look at the evidence to survey, can you name the, the big things that you know? No, 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 it matters. The things that we do here matters. And I'm not telling you which one I are, what to do in those situations, but those things are, are for sure. No, no question. You need to focus on this. I, I know that's not how you present in the book, but, but in your personal assessment, is there a list of things that, you know, if we don't do it, you're putting yourself in a disadvantage or, or, or not? So part of what I think, let me like answer this with a philosophical argument um, that I, that I, I see with uh, coming up even more so with, with sort of little kids, but I think extends to this age range too. Um, so when you look at, at kind of parenting from zero to three, on the one hand, it's completely clear that the things that happen in the first three years, the first five years of kids' lives are incredibly important for their long-term success and for their long-term, for all kinds of long-term outcomes that, you know, by the time kids are showing up in pre-K or in kindergarten, a lot of the, the sort of path that they're on, not that we can't 
affect that. There's tons of things we can do with policy, but like there's a huge amount of stuff that happens early in life that clearly really, really matters. And it's part of why we emphasize, you know, pre-K or better childcare, all the kinds of stuff like sort of supports that we can provide to parents at the at early in life. On the other hand, when you dig into like, what is it? Like what is going on? The, it's almost impossible to identify anything that uh, that really like anything that's actually sort of concretely Im important, um, or that we can identify data on that that matters. And I think that that partly that is because probably many of the things that matter are uh, really nebulous, and partly it's because you know we're the kinds of individual things we're studying themselves don't matter. It's the sort of combination of kind of like stable parenting. There's like a lot of good ways to do it, but sort of there are things we can't see. So. So I think that's part of the, the challenge in all of this is that we know that in some ways parenting matters, but it's very difficult to identify any individual part of our parenting that is actually um, that is actually important and or is like really like the one thing to focus on. So if I look at the stuff I, I study in them, I like review the data on in the uh, in in the book, there's a lot of, you know, food like does it, we don't really know that much about what kinds of diet happen, but like it probably doesn't matter. Too, too, too much, our, our evidence is really poor. I mean, sleep is the one sort of that comes out as really like clearly uh, very, very important. And then there are other pieces um, where I think the way we're framing them often to ourselves are wrong. So when people talk about extracurriculars, particularly in this kind of space of people that I often talk to, there's so much focus on the idea of like, well, extracurriculars as an opportunity for achievement. So extracurriculars as like, I got to get my kid into this thing because they're going to get to college. They're going to get into like, you know, they're going to go to the Olympics. I don't know what we think is going on with our kids. Actually, there is some evidence that extracurriculars are valuable uh, for kids, but it's all around their kind of sense of belonging and socio-emotional development and using extracurriculars and extracurriculars being a way for your kid to feel like they're good at something or feel included in some in some setting that is separate from their sort of typical social social interaction but that has nothing to do with you know whether it's going to get them into college that's a that's a benefit that accrues because your kid likes the activity and even if they are not doing it at a very high level and so i think that's a place where we've just like missed a little bit that we there's a value to what we're doing but we've missed a little bit what it is all right another question here in the chat um do you think you revise your first two books with more data as more studies come, come along and uh, make sure that they continue to be relevant? Yeah, so, so my, um, the, the first book on pregnancy um, initially came out in 2013, um, which obviously now is quite a long, long time ago. Um, and actually in this last, sort of in the last year or so, we did a very large revision. Um, which added more chapters and and kind of updated um, updated a lot of the evidence. You know, it's it's interesting because on the one hand there are definitely new studies that come out all the time. On the other hand, it's it's actually not that common for something to come out that's so big that you would say, okay, this really changes how we see see this. So it does happen, and and you know we want to be careful when it does. But I think sometimes people feel like, well, just every time there's a new study, you must have to update. And the answer is like, no, actually, is if we're like good Bayesians, we should not be updating. <laughs> For every single individual study, you know that, Carlos. You know that better than I do. Um, see anybody else here? Let's have a, give it a chance in the chat here. If somebody else to raise their hands, or um, I have a couple of other questions here. Um, is Bridgeton any good? I mean, you mentioned that a couple Bridgeton, of times. No. I, mean, I don't think it's for you, Carlos, but I, I Jill, Jill Furley, you know, a, um, a little gendered. Uh, yeah. So a follow up on the on the on the question um, about the updates. Any particular thing that that surprised you since since you wrote any of the two books that might, might have changed your mind or not changed your mind, but changed the way you present any of the chapters? So one of the um, you know, the 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 biggest sort of back and forth evidence in the in the in the, the pregnancy book in particular has been around the question of sleep position, which is like a like an you know, so like a somewhat active area of research, the question of whether stillbirth rates are or uh, are higher if you sleep on your back or like if, if you there should be restrictions on people's on people's sleep position. Um, and it, this is a place where like most of the evidence we have has been very poor. It's through what we call case control studies, which are like notoriously quite difficult to learn from because of the way we select the sample. It's just they just like have a lot of problems. Um, and a few years ago, 
uh, the first kind of large perspective study came out, still not like what we consider gold standard for causality, nothing about an RCT, but at least it was a perspective study that followed people over time and it showed effectively no, um, no impact of sleep position. So that's a place where there's a sort of big update um, where there's like a big update. And then there, the other things is there have been a bunch of updates to guidelines around labor. Um, although interestingly, in a bunch of those cases, the, the data on which they were updating was so old that actually even in the like first edition of Expecting Better, that was the data I was relying on and saying, hey, like the guidelines that we have are not really consistent with the data that we're seeing. And then subsequent to that they later, I mean, not because of the, but just because of the sort of speed with things with which things move, eventually it became the case that actually the guidelines were in line with the with the data. So that's a little bit of a different shift. Interesting. All right, another question here. Uh, any recommendations in the body training books, very specifically? Mm, um, you know, people the, like with the potty training, you gotta just choose if you're gonna be the person who takes away the underwear or not. Um, and if you're just gonna take away the underwear, you want like the three day potty training, one of the three day potty training methods. Um, and, and that's, those are the only ones with like real methods, but there's a lot of different ways to potty train your kid and none of them work great. So let's switch, switch, uh, switch to COVID a bit. Yeah. Um, what's the current, I mean, you did a lot of enormous, phenomenal, incredibly important research and presentation of the evidence around these particular school choices in terms of, of masks for not sending your kids to school now during, during the pandemic. And I know, you know, controversies, whatever, let's not focus on that, focus on the fact that, um, where are we now? What do we see, you know, in terms of, in terms of the way, when you look at the, the cross-sectional data you were able to collect, I'm still, you're still updating that, right? On, on, uh, uh, do we know what the stage is in terms of, you know, are still schools, maybe they're not as, as much in presence as I would hope for, or, or masking. I mean, I have yeah. a kid still in a school with masking. So, so I just wonder what's the prevalence of that out there. So, so like in terms of, there's sort of, many different pieces of this. So in terms of actual, like in sort of normal, like in schoolness, that's been pretty, pretty consistent for most of the US over the last year, at least in terms of like over this last school year, at least in terms of like actually being able, being able to be in school. Um, and so there were some districts that shut down and sort of went more virtual in January. Those are also the districts that were basically not in person at all in the sort of previous year. And so there's a little bit of a, of a kind of like double, uh, double whammy for those, um, for those kids, but most places have been sort of pretty consistently in person. I would say over the last kind of maybe from the beginning of March, we've seen a very fast push into like real more normalcy. So get rid of the masks, let's have school sports, let's have like, right, let's have people be able to come as spectators, you know, particularly in the kind of more um, left-leaning districts, uh, which had had been more restricted. A lot of the country that was kind of just doing this regular all, all year, and in fact, all of the last school year as well. So I think we've sort of seen more of this return to normalcy. I think where now the challenges lie is in recovery um, and recovery in terms of, you know, we're looking at some data on test scores, you know, there are really big declines in, in test scores, um, you know, to this, over the sort of 2020, 2021 school year, relative to 2019, those test scores are just like hugely, huge learning losses. As we measure them, some of that will be made up. How much of it, I don't know. Um, we're also seeing enormous uh, changes in, um, uh, in, uh, sorry, enormous costs in terms of socio, like mental health, and it's unclear how exactly we're gonna we're gonna recover those. So I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, pandemic. I don't know, like long term consequences that we're still grappling with, particularly around kids. And you are you are uh, uh, collecting data on that and planning on studying this further. As, that is, as, yeah, as, yeah. So we have a we have a paper on test scores, and I think we're hoping we'll soon have a paper about the sort of mental health impacts and trying to think about how that was mitigated by remote schooling. Or and is that correlated at all with anything that, that with the sort of this, the extent to which the schools were closed and things like that? Or well, yeah, the test scores are like yeah, the test scores are are really a lot. The test score losses are enormously larger um, in districts that were uh, that were that were closed. Um, so. Moving from fully virtual to fully in person is like, I don't know, a 13 percentage point difference in the drop in test scores oh. um, in the data. And that's actually within, this is like a little in the weeds, but that's within commuting zone. So that's like basically places that had otherwise quite similar pandemic experiences, but just, you know, 
you're you're open and the other other guy is not. Is that a working paper out in there yet or not? Yeah, yet? that's it. There's an MBR working paper on this, and it's, right. uh, it's, it's right. a conditional right. accepted AR insights. So maybe I'll, I'll call you in for a fourth appearance very soon on that paper. <laughs> exactly, we can we can do that. That's a that's a sh quick paper. <laughs> All right, let's see anybody else here. We, we're not eating too much of your time. It's about an hour. Um, all right, let me just finish and thank you again. And uh, to say that one of the things that I do using one of your books that I teach a freshman class on policy evaluation. And that class, it would try to, you know, of course, it goes very data-driven, very economics-oriented and thinking about trade-offs. But we also think a lot about values. We have a philosopher that teaches uh, half a class with me, essentially, thinking about values, how to understand values before decision-making and so on. Um, I make them do a case study on breastfeeding. Uh -huh. and book and references there because I want to make sure they understand that this framework that we're putting forward applies to not only economic policy questions, but like things like breastfeeding. Now, the funny part is that whenever I go through that lecture, this freshman are looking at me like, I don't want to talk about this. You know? <laughs> it's one of the most awkward times in the classes when talking about breastfeeding. So I, I thank you for putting that yeah. material together because it's incredibly useful. That's so. good. Yeah, I was when I was probably the most awkward seminar I think I ever uh, I ever gave at Booth, where we used to both both work, was about menstrual cups, uh, and because it was like an evaluation I did, and I brought in a menstrual cup, and I handed it around, and just watching the like business school professors sort of like push slowly push the menstrual cup. I was like, you know, it's not used; it's clean, it's fine. Just, that was great. That note. Uh... Yes, on that note. <laughs> Thank you again, Emily, so much, and I'll see you Very soon. Very nice to see.